Well, amen. We're looking at a series on Galatians uh, this month as we move forward. We began it last week, so we're still at the very beginning of our venture through there. And we are focusing on the grace of God and the grace that Paul focused on and wanted to emphasize uh, to the believers in Galatia that had been influenced by the Judaizing Christians that were trying to add back things to the completed work of Jesus Christ. And, and we want to visit, perhaps revisit those texts as we go through this series to just remind us in our evangelism and in our stand of just what Jesus did on our behalf. I'm so glad you're here. You may be seated as we uh, look today. I want to, last week we looked at, uh, at the gospel of grace as Paul uh, began that in the very first part of Galatians. But today uh, we want to look at the call, the call of grace. And, and Paul uh, brings that out richly in the last part of chapter 1. And that's what we want to focus on today. We want to look at the call. Sometimes we, we hear the phrase, uh, you know, he or she has a real calling. Uh, maybe a, it's a doctor or a surgeon. Maybe it's an artist. Maybe it's a carpenter. Uh, somebody who is really skilled, really uh, adept at what it is that they are doing. And we'll say, well, they must have a real Calling And usually when we attribute that, it's not so much uh, God that's calling them as much as that they're just really extra skilled. But sometimes uh, we will include that there must be just sort of a, a divine enablement of some kind uh, that they have. In the church world, uh, we often hear about people being called to pastor, right? And, and we'll hear that calling, and that is certainly a definite calling. It's one that's mentioned in Scripture with all kinds of qualifications and things. But what Paul shares with us, and sometimes we don't uh, quite focus on as much, is that through grace, God calls us to salvation. Uh, he calls us to His service. Uh, it's not uh, a, a specific uh, uh, occupation as maybe being a pastor is, but it is nonetheless the leading and the guiding and the calling of God. And Paul wants to mention that. So what he is addressing and the problem that he is dealing with, that he is sort of countering with the Galatians, is the notion that he is bringing a, a, a teaching that he has learned from some other people. That was very common. People would, would uh, uh, hear someone, a, a rabbi, they would teach a certain uh, way of looking at things, and then the disciples would repeat that, and pretty soon they'd start a movement uh, based on certain specific kinds of teaching. And they were seeing that what Paul was doing was something that had been derived from some other people. And so Paul, very early in the letter, after having scolded the Galatians that they have been so quickly removed from the gospel, and there's really only one gospel, is the gospel that he had preached to them, and anything else you ought to be accursed, he then goes on to talk about where the gospel came from, where his preaching, in other words, came from. And, and, and in verses in 11 and 12, uh, he wants to, to let the Galatians know that uh, the only true gospel was never derived from some other rabbi. It, it wasn't something that uh, another man had taught him, even an apostle had taught him, or, or something like that. That it was not just, in other words, an ideology or a philosophy. Now, how does the world view Christianity today? Pure Christianity, it often just views it as one of many ideas, one of many uh, ways of looking at the world. And doesn't see it as the truth that has its origins in God himself. And that's what Paul is dealing with. He's dealing with what is really a contemporary uh, complaint that we have today. The idea that Christianity is just one idea above many. But what, call, what Paul wants to show is that the calling that he received was not the result of, of, of ideology and of training but it was the result of a direct call that he had on his life that God gracefully gave to them. 
And so to, to highlight that, he, he's going to go on to talk about his own background. And his background is an anti-Christ background. And if you know something about the Apostle Paul, uh, you understand that he, his roots, his, his training was in fact in Judaism. And in fact, he was a very zealous uh, 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 student of Judaism. Uh, he uh, exceeded many of his contemporaries. This was his career. His career was to be a rabbi. His, his career was to zealously uphold the law and the teachings of that. So when the, the latest trend, as he saw it, called the way came along, he saw that as so uh, opposed to Judaism that he set out very zealously to knock it down, to attack churches, to imprison those who claim to be Christians, to just try to wipe this out. That's how zealous he was. He doesn't have a background of growing up in church. He doesn't have a background of having studied under disciples. It's quite the opposite. He was very anti-church, anti-Christians. And he, he shares that in verse 13 of chapter 1. He says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Could you bring me down just a little bit, at least up here in the monitors? He had a very non-church background. He was not one who uh, uh, had pursued Jesus. And that's so important to lay out what grace means. And he's building the case for grace. He, he's not someone who uh, uh, had anything to do with Christ. We, we hear about this if you study in the book of Acts. That's how we're introduced to the Apostle Paul. He was one who stood by while Stephen gets stoned. Uh, he is one who is on his way to Damascus with letters from the Sanhedrin to arrest more people and to try to just uh, uh, to, to try to blot out this new movement called Christianity. So his story is not a story of lifelong Christian discipleship. And I keep mentioning that because in this room and watching us online today are going to be those who have decided that you are not capable or worthy or qualified or somehow able to do any kind of calling from God because of your background. You weren't raised in church. You weren't uh, uh, raised in VBS. You weren't one who was there every Sunday. You don't have a background in that. And so you, as a result, uh, you kind of disqualify yourself from being of any use to God. Well, you can't be as disqualified in that kind of terminology as the Apostle Paul was. He was very disqualified. He not only was not interested in being a Christian, he was very interested in wiping them out and did a good job of it. Saw to the death of one of them, perhaps others, wanted to wipe out the movement all together. And so when he says, you heard about my former life, well, of course they've heard about his former life. Uh, he was notorious. He persecuted the church, and notice he did it violently. He wasn't just a debater. He didn't just show up on the street corner and, and begin to argue. All right, He was one who violently persecuted. Okay? He was the Antifa of the Christian church in that day. He did everything he could to try to destroy it. But then we come to verse 14. The very next verse, he says, I was advancing in Judaism. In fact, I was advancing in Judaism, and it's the Judaizers who have come to Galatia, to those churches, and are influencing them. He says, listen, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my, my own age, uh, among those of my people, because I was so extremely zealous uh, for the traditions of my fathers. I wasn't just half-hearted. I wasn't just a Sabbath-only kind of Jew. 
Uh, I was very zealous for what I did. That's why I became so violent. That's why I tried to destroy the church. I was, I was advancing. I knew all about this. I knew more about Judaism and the, the rituals and circumcision and the holidays and all of that more than others. I knew the Old Testament scriptures, he's saying, even more than the other students that were of my own age. I was advancing so much in that direction. What's he saying here? Well, to bring this to today, because this is more than just a nostalgic look at the Apostle Paul, what he's saying in today's language, I think, is that his, uh, his Judaism was a chosen career path for him. That's the career that he chose. Uh, you would choose to be a rabbi. You would choose to pursue this advanced education. And you know what? He was committed to it. It wasn't half-hearted. It wasn't that he just sort of picked a, a career and then he's going to change. No, he was doing very well at that. And I want you to make this comparison as we go forward because it's not that God can't call you because you didn't choose to be a, a preacher. You didn't choose to be a deacon. You didn't choose to be a Sunday school teacher. You didn't choose to have perfect church attendance. So since you didn't choose that, you've actually chosen a different career path. And quite frankly, you're doing very well in this other career path. You might even say God is blessing you in this other. So there's no way God would call you to do something else. And that's where the Apostle Paul was. This is not someone who was looking for a change. All right? He wasn't bored with what he was doing. He was very zealous for it. He, he, uh, he wasn't trying to change careers midstream. He wasn't having a midlife crisis. Uh, he was quite content at what he was doing. He, he was not somebody that we would think that was in any way destined for ministry. When we think of those that are destined for ministry, we're thinking of those who grew up in church, who did really well in their youth group, who, 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 who pursued it, you know, uh, with uh, groups in college, and, and, and boy, they just are, they're going down the right path. That's not the Apostle Paul. And that's not so many of us. We, we, we decide we're not going to be used of God because that's not the path that we've been going down. Well, that's not the path he's been going down either. But what I want to tell you is that God's calling, it's not based on one's past behavior. God's calling on your life and his decision to use you is not based on whether or not you have done the prerequisites. This isn't a college degree that he's going to hand out to you provided that you've done the right amount of English and social studies, that you've done the right amount of Sunday schools and VBSs and student groups and Bible studies and women's groups, and you've done all of these things, and therefore God says, you know what, uh, he might be somebody I could use. No, it's not based on your past behavior. And so if your past behavior has no Christ in it at all, that doesn't exclude you from God's calling. Not, not at all. In fact, in, in some ways, it almost looks like that's who he winds up calling, is those who have no past experience in it. It doesn't have anything to do with your past behavior. It's more like uh, you know, your self-assessment of being uh, unqualified to really be used of God. It just has no bearing with God. And I think what you'll find, it's as though the Lord awakens that part of you which didn't even exist before when He decides to use you in whatever ways and direction He wants to use you in ministry. So what I want to do before we even step any further into this message is I want you to pull down and throw away that excuse you have of, oh, God won't use me because of what I did yesterday. God won't use me because of the way I acted years ago. God won't use me because of all the failures I'm going through right now. God will never call me to do something significant because my life has been so insignificant with Him up till now. God won't call me to change my life because I'm so successful at what I'm doing now. God only wants me to continue doing what I'm doing now and, and because uh, and th this is Him blessing me doing this, there's no way He would want me to change. You've got to throw that away. You've got to throw that away. 
Because when God calls a life, he, he doesn't base it on your past behavior, your training, your education, your success, none of those things. Now, we often will look at someone who's, had, who's going through a series of, of mishaps and failures and say, well, you know, maybe God's got something else planned for them. But how many times do we look to the person who is very successful, the top of their class, the top in their job, the top in their business, uh, uh, got the nice house, the nice family, the nice income, and say, I bet God's getting ready to get rid of all of that and change. Yeah, we don't look at that, but this is the Apostle Paul. He was very successful at what he was doing, and God has a different plan for him. And so as we begin to break down what he's saying, so he's, he's already told us that he was advancing uh, ahead of those his own age, that he was very zealous for the things of God, and then we come to verse 15. In verse 15, in the first part of verse 16, I want to break this down so that we don't miss with the phrasing of Paul because Paul is great at writing huge long sentences with a lot of commas. And so we want to break these down a little bit. So in verse 15, he says, but. I was advancing. I was very successful. I was very zealous. Everything was going great. My parents were proud of me. Uh, My rabbis were proud of me. Uh, 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 Everybody thought I was doing great, but. When he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Notice how Paul starts with that that but. But when he who had set me apart before I was born. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's Jeremiah, isn't it? Jeremiah talks about how he had been set apart in his mother's womb. And the apostle uh, makes that comparison. He realizes that God has a plan for him, and God had a plan for him from before he was born. And God has a plan for you. And God's plan for you is not because you just scored 100 on your Bible test. Oh, wow, that's a smart one. I need to go recruit him. No, God has a plan for you from before you are born. He has a purpose and a plan. You may not realize it. You may not obey it. You may not follow it. But God has a plan and a purpose. And he did for the Apostle Paul. He said, he who had set me apart before I was born. He had a plan for me that I didn't even see. It wasn't even in my upbringing. But he had already made a plan for me. And I want you to know that you haven't slipped through the cracks either. You may think, well, I'm, you know, I've gone the other way. I've, uh, uh, I've made these failures. I've, I've chosen the secular life. Or I've had too many years of mistakes, too many divorces, too many uh, uh, business failures, too many bad grades. Uh, I'm I've not of any use to God now. But you haven't slipped through the cracks. God still has a plan and a purpose for you that He derived before you were even born. In fact, it is exactly because you aren't worthy that you are called by His grace. See, that's the idea of grace. Grace is God extending this mercy to you, God extending His favor to you when you're not worthy of it. If you're worthy of it, it wouldn't be grace. It would be payback. It would be uh, an equal exchange. But because you're unworthy, God still extends gracefully the call to you. He does it just out of His grace, not because uh, of anything else. This, This isn't a sales call that God makes. That's not the call. It's not where God is coming to to sell you. It's not that you're somebody that God is coming to recruit. All right? You you see it with star athletes. Uh, different recruiters come to them, different coaches come to them, they start recruiting them, boy, we could really use you. That's not what the calling of God is. He, he's not looking at the fact that you answer every question in Sunday school and high school and says, I'm going to recruit that guy into, into my service. It's not a sales call where he's saying, you know what, uh, I can help you do better than you've been doing. No, it's all by grace. God simply extends that call to you. It's not a sales call. 
It's a rescue that God extends. That's what His grace is about. In fact, let me say that Jesus doesn't call you because He needs you. He calls you because He's pleased to do so. Jesus doesn't call you to whatever level of ministry, whatever involvement He is wanting, because He desperately needs you. Because you are really an exceptional singer. You're an exceptional Bible student. You're an outgoing personality. Whatever we might naturally think would be definite attributes to somebody who's going to engage in any kind of ministry, God doesn't call you because He needs you. He calls you because He's pleased to do so. Boy, that ought to encourage you if you're feeling really down on yourself. That ought to encourage you if, uh, if you are uh, made a lot of mistakes in your path to a career or to a life uh, uh, in relationships and, and you've got just a whole stack of mistakes that you've made along the way to know that God will call you because He's pleased to call you. Not because you have pre-qualified, but because He just chooses to do it out of His good pleasure. You don't win a competition to be called of God. You aren't recruited as a prized scholar or a super athlete with God. What a good excuse if His calling was like the world's. Uh, Because then you would say, well, I'm not a super athlete, so uh, he's never going to call me, right? I'm not super qualified for that. Uh, And what do you do when you're not a great athlete? Well, you just watch the great athletes on TV, don't you? You go to the stands and you watch those athletes because you're not one of them, and so you're just a spectator. How many Christians have settled for being a spectator Because we've decided that since we're not a super Christian, since we don't have whatever kind of abilities that we decide are are worthy of someone, that, uh, that we don't have to do anything. We're not qualified for that. We'll just sit in the stands and we'll watch others. But God doesn't care about those things. It's no comparison to God's calling on your life when we look at how athletes are recruited or how scholars are recruited God's calling is completely different and our response to God's calling on our life is always very simple and that's obedience we are to simply obey his calling on our life not to make excuses not to decide that it can't be but to say Father here am I Send me. All right? Uh, Send me. Let me know what it is that you would have me to do. So, to back up again in Galatians 1.16 and to pick up again in that phrase, he says that Jesus was pleased to reveal His Son to me. God was pleased to reveal Jesus to me in order that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. So, again, He was pleased to reveal Him to me. Uh, God revealed Jesus not because Paul had asked for it, not because Paul had been raised in it, not because Paul had been trained by other apostles, but because God was pleased to do so. And He is pleased to reveal Himself to you, not because you have grown up in it and now you have qualified for it, but because He's pleased to do so. And He is pleased to call you. He is pleased to use you. He is pleased to employ you in whatever His ministry is that He would have you to do because He is just pleased to do so. And then Paul says, He who called me because He was pleased to do so to reveal His Son in me. Now that's, that, has, uh, that speaks so much more than just His calling to an apostle. We're not even talking about His own salvation that revealed Jesus to him, just as he reveals Jesus to all of us. And our response is the same response Paul had, and that is to obey, to accept, to believe. And having revealed his Son in him, he then doesn't stop there. He reveals his purpose for Paul. And Paul's purpose was to preach to the Gentiles. 
That doesn't come up immediately, but Paul will discover, really even through some negative situations, that that's where God is sending him. But now he's able, after on this side of the Galatian letter, to say that he uh, was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might achieve the purpose that God had for me from before I was born, and that was that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The missing component in modern Christians is that you're called to a purpose. You're called to a purpose. God doesn't just call you and has nothing further to do with you. I'll see you in heaven. No, God calls you to serve Him. And oh, what would happen in our churches today if our believers came to discover the calling that God has on their life and the purpose that God has for all of us, not just the guy standing up here right now, not just the one or two others that you might see on a stage, but that God has a purpose and a plan for every one of us, irrespective of our past behavior, irrespective of our training, that He has a call for us and that we might be totally shocked at what God has called us for. For Paul, it was to lead church planting among Gentile nations. Now that's almost hilarious. Why? Because Paul was a Jew of the Jews. He was a Jew, and a Jew thought Gentiles were dogs, a little bit less than human, certainly unimportant to the things of God. And in fact, the Jewish church in Jerusalem, they had no intention of going to the Gentiles. You understand that? At first, they were only trying to get the other Jews to believe in Jesus. They had no idea of even taking the gospel to the Gentiles. But if you're going to take the gospel to the Gentiles, surely you're not going to get somebody like Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, who was trained and advanced in Judaism, uh, tell him to go to the Gentiles? They didn't even think the Gentiles were worth speaking to. And if you go to, as I've mentioned before, you go to Israel today and you bump into a, an Orthodox Jew, they're going to just get very angry. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to acknowledge you. They don't want to even uh, touch you. This is the Apostle Paul. And Paul said, I'm going to let him go to the Gentiles. You thought that he, you know, if I'm choosing, I'm going to send Paul to Jerusalem to convert all the rest of the Jews to Christianity. Because he's a Jew, a Jew of the Jew. He would know all those arguments. I'm not going to send him to the Gentiles. I'll save somebody else for that. That's how we think, but that's not how God thinks. God had a purpose and a reason for all of that. There was no, no plan for going to the Gentiles. No, no one was even thinking about that. So what did Jesus do? He took the most orthodox person and sent him in the most unorthodox setting. And so beware. He will take you that has no connection to what he is going to call you to do, that has the most unorthodox background to do the most orthodox thing, or that has the most orthodox background but it's over in this area to do the most unorthodox thing that you have no training for no expectation of at all and boy it happens our lives are going down a road we've got it all planned out you know we've got 2.3 kids we've got a two-car garage we're, we're doing all these these things and then God plants this crazy idea in our mind he begins to awaken us to something we've never thought about before, a person, a group, an area, a ministry, a something that we have no background, but it fascinates us. We don't even know why we're thinking about it. It doesn't seem to make any sense at all. And then God begins to unveil and show us what he desires for us. I'm proof of it, Okay. Uh, I'm proof of it. I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't go to church uh, when I was raised. I, I, I went to some Bible schools if my relatives did, but that was not my, my Sunday to Sunday. That was not my day. 
Uh, I started going because I was dating a girl that was going. Uh, and it was there that I was saved. That was kind of the extent of it, I thought. So I went on to college and I got my degree and, uh, you know, eventually in the thing that I was most interested in that seemed to make the most sense to me and had absolutely nothing to do with church or Bible or sociology, which is my worst subject in college, you know, dealing with people. Uh, I liked math and I liked science and I liked those things. I did well in those, but I knew if there was anything that that was my career was to do something in math, something in science, translate that into something in computers, and that became what I was to do for the bulk of my life. That was my talent. That was my skill. It just wasn't God's plan. And God had a completely different plan that he unveiled to me in the most unusual of circumstances over a period of several weeks or a month or so that said, you need to change. You need to change. And I entered into the ministry with absolutely no background in it. And that's what God does. He will send you in a direction that you had not planned to go. Jesus took the most orthodox person to do the most unorthodox thing. So let me tell you, your past does not predict your future. I know what, this, I know what the world says. The world says that uh, uh, you can't ever change, right? If you're a cheat, you'll always be a cheat. If you're a failure, you'll be a, a failure. If you're, uh, if you're dishonest, you'll always be dishonest. If you're, uh, if you're one kind of person, you're always going to be that person. You might can bend, but you'll never change. But I want to tell you, with God, with His grace, that your past does not predict your future. Your past does not predict your future. I'm going to say that again. Your past does not predict your future when God is involved. He can give you a future that you had never thought of to do either the most unorthodox thing or the most orthodox thing that is totally different than what you're expecting your trajectory of your life to follow. And that's exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul. You may be looking at your bad habits and you may be secretly embarrassed to serve. I mean, what if somebody found out? Uh, You may look at your failed marriage or your failed career choice and and you may self-judge yourself as only capable of of doing just a minimal amount because after all, I've had all this public uh, problems. Jesus takes delight in revealing himself through utter failure. He takes delight in revealing himself so that all the praise and glory will go to him and not to you. A great example of that was this social outcast that we find in the Gospels who was, uh, uh, we call him the the maniac of Gadara. Uh, He suffered mania. Uh, He had a, a mental psychological condition that caused him to have spurts of wild uh, fits. And as a result, he wound up living in the cemetery because he couldn't live with other people. He was so wild, so uncontrolled, they said they couldn't even chain him down, you know. You, know, you can imagine his mom and dad trying to, trying to chain him down at the house so he wouldn't go off, but he would just get out. And so finally he just left. Now let me tell you something about this guy. He'll never be of any use to God. When you're the maniac of Gadara, when you're a crazy person, nobody wants to be around who can't even communicate with other people, much less share a gospel message. This is the one person who will never have any business being in a church or having anything to do with God, so say the entire society of the world. But not God. Not God. Because Jesus lands on the shore where this man is and and he goes to this man. This man comes to him and Jesus heals him and saves him. And the Bible tells us he sits at the feet of Jesus with a sound mind. That's the first step. The second step is the man now wants to follow Jesus. Okay? 
He hadn't been able to follow anybody. Now he says, man, you know, what you've done to me and you've so delivered me, I want to be around you all the time. I'm going to become another disciple of yours. And I can imagine the other disciples are like, uh, oh, don't say, don't say yes, don't say yes, don't say yes, don't say yes. The boat's too small. Don't say yes, don't say yes. And Jesus doesn't say yes. But here's what Jesus said. In Mark 5, 19, we have one account of it. He, Jesus, did not permit this former maniac, this former uh, uh, man who suffered mania, he did not permit him to go with him, but listen to what he said to him. He said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. You know, the people that, uh, that would be just as happy if he never came back, the people that couldn't even chain him down, the people that were rid of him, uh, the people that he couldn't be around, uh, that he had probably done more damage in those relationships that he could ever repair. He had caused more harm. Jesus says, won't you go back to your friends and tell them what God has done for you? Because he is about to be an unbelievable transformation of a human being. And so it tells us in verse 20 of Mark 5 that he went away and he began to proclaim in the ten cities in the Decapolis, that region, uh, the, the eastern part of uh, the Sea of Galilee, he began to proclaim how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Uh, Peter could have gone up and preached right? Uh, uh, Philip, uh, some of the, Andrew, some of the others, they could have gone through the Decapolis, but here is a, the most unorthodox choice of Jesus who goes and they can't help but marvel at the transformation that they have seen in this person's life. Here's somebody who is so unqualified uh, to, to do so, and yet God chooses him. Why? Because your past does not predict your future. God will use you even though up to this point in life you have been uh, the, the, the bad influence of everybody around you and have been the bad story of everybody who talks about you. God can use you in a powerful way. So much so that Jesus said, you don't need to follow me right now. You don't need to be discipled by me right now. What you need to do is you need to go back and tell your friends that what great things God has done for you. And that's exactly what he does, and everyone marvels. Wow. Paul continues uh, talking about his transformation in Galatians 1. We're going to pick up that last phrase of verse 16 and, and look at 17. He says, I did not, after what had happened, God being pleased to reveal himself to me, showing me that my purpose was to preach to the Gentiles. He said, I did not immediately consult with anyone. When, when I received the calling of God, I want you to remember this, write this down, know this. Paul, when he received God's initial impulse in his calling, he said, I did not consult with anyone. Instead, he says, uh, I, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, you know, to the, to the Mecca, to, the, to, to the, 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 the hub of Christianity, which no doubt was in Jerusalem, where a lot of the apostles were at the time, where the evangelism was taking place among the other Hebrew Christians that were being converted there. He said, I didn't go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but here's what he did. I went away into Arabia. Have you heard of that before? Well, sure. That's what it, uh, Elijah does. Uh, when he runs from Jezebel, uh, he goes till he comes to a mountain, Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, and he stays there, and that's where God speaks to him in a still, small voice. It is there at Mount Sinai that Moses, another completely and totally unqualified person, goes. And it is here that we see the Apostle Paul. You know what he's doing? He's spending time alone with God. His first impulse, his first direction 
was not to go to uh, uh, among all the other apostles because he's trying to show the case that listen I'm not just repeating what other people told you uh, told me I am telling you what Jesus himself told me what he revealed himself to me and I want you to know that even when I was saved even when I received this calling of God I didn't immediately just run to them instead I went and I contemplated that I had to go and study to pray to, to, to listen to God just like Elijah did on the same mountain. To spend time and, and to study. So this is what I'm telling you. When you feel that impulse that God is calling you to make that change or to start that ministry or to do that thing that He wants you to do with your family or in your community or at your work or whatever it might be, that doesn't mean that, that tomorrow uh, you're going to be totally prepared and ready to go. What it means is that now is the time for you to pause and to draw aside to God and to spend time alone with Him and to pray. I would do that. My wife and I, when I was contemplating ministry, we take these long walks uh, down the, the gravel roads up by 10 Mile and we would, we would ponder back and forth and discuss things. It was not an immediate uh, well, I decided yesterday I'm going to change today. No, we, we wanted to confirm the call. We wanted to know what does this mean? How is God moving us? And, and that's what He's doing. Uh, he, he didn't go to Jerusalem immediately. He went to Arabia. And then He would return to Damascus, which is where He was headed in the first place when He was saved. He was on His way to Damascus. And now He's going to return there. But He's going to come to Damascus now a completely different person than the one who was heading there. God will allow you perhaps to continue on the path you were on, but now you're going to do so as a completely different person and you're going to see things with a completely different priority than you had before. You're going to be a different father. You're going to be a different mother. You're going to be a different student. You're going to be a different employee than you had been before as God begins to unveil Himself. Paul didn't know when he came to Damascus that God was going to send him to the Gentiles yet. He just knew that God was dealing on his life. He's now spent time alone with God. And this is what I want you to to know, Because maybe there are some of you here who are thinking God is calling me. Uh, he is wanting me to make this big change. So here's just what I want you to know. Your greatest preparation is the time you spend alone with God. Amen. Greater than seminary, greater than college, greater than uh, whatever it might be. Whatever it is, however God is leading you, whatever that direction means to you, the greatest step you will ever take is to spend time alone with God and to make it a significant amount of time. Not just a five-minute prayer, not just uh, uh, letting your mind wander during Sunday school, but to spend hours and days and weeks and more until you feel a certain solidified understanding of what God wants you to do. He's given you the boldness and the courage to do it, and you're ready to step out and to move forward. The greatest preparation that we ever make in ministry Whatever that ministry might be, it might be a call to preach, it might be a call to pastor, it might be to do something else, but the greatest preparation we ever make is actually the time we spend alone with God. More than everything else, we've got to spend and carve out a significant amount of time with Him. And so, of course, you know what Satan does. He makes our world so busy we don't even have time. He fills us with so much entertainment and so much uh, craziness that we can't carve that time out to have that moment with God for Him to show, I called you for a purpose. I saw you before you were even formed, before you were even in your mother's womb. I had a purpose and a plan that I am calling you to. And we have to get alone with God and we have to reconcile and reason with Him to discover what that purpose is. For Paul, three years will go by before he really begins to step out. And even then, there's going to be a 14-year process of him gearing up, uh, he tells us in, in the, the later part of these verses. For Moses, it was a 40-year gap of time where he is alone in a, as a shepherd and God gets to the point where he reveals himself to Moses. For Abraham, 
There's a sense in which it took all of Abraham's life till he was over a hundred before God really unveiled his promises to him. He had shown him, he had talked about him, he had led him, but he didn't really get to see it even till what was near the end of his and Sarah's life. And so don't expect that God does this when you walk off the stage with your high school diploma. Sometimes it'll be when you walk off the stage with your uh, retirement watch at whatever that age is, 65. I don't know, that's way beyond me. But it might be something like that. It may not be that God will will make all your decisions for you early in life. He may interrupt it in the mid-30s and totally change your direction. But go alone with Him. John's, the Apostle John, his great works didn't occur until he was nearly 100 years old. When we read the Gospel of John, when we see 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, when we see uh, the book of Revelation... That's near the very end of a life, much of which is spent in isolation. You wouldn't think he was qualified for anything. And God chooses to use him in a great and mighty way. He chooses to use you. He has a plan for you and a purpose for you. Get alone with him. If you have a sense of it, pursue that with God. If you have no sense, say, God, here I am. Send me. All right. Be like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. And, and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Uh, I know there's a need here. I don't know wh- how I could possibly fill it, but you have put this on my heart. Send me. Show me. Am I to be a witness at my job? Am I to be a better parent in my home? Am I to be a better worker at my church? Lord, send me and, and show me. Let me spend time with you. Let me let not, this not be just some sort of flippant reaction based on a sermon, but let me spend time and discover what your will and your purpose is for my life. And I think what you're going to discover is He has a very unorthodox purpose for you that's not at all related to the orthodox upbringing that you've had. And God will use you greatly. Let's pray. Father.